Hi folks, it's good to be with you. I love to everybody out there. We're looking at this book, The Battle for the Bible, by David Marshall, and uh, published by Autumn Press. And we're looking at the issue of the Old Testament under fire. And don't forget my website, jasonbloodspreacher.com, and uh, Roy Blood Ministries website, and Facebook and Twitter, and my Facebook and Twitter. So we're looking at Old Testament under fire. Controversy over the reliability and accuracy of the Bible came to a head in the 18th century, the Age of Reason in particular. It focused on the Old Testament. The Hebrew text of the Old Testament was based on manuscripts that were produced as late as the 9th century AD. They were the earliest manuscripts known. Many scholars were adamant that the Bible could not be trusted. German scholar Frederick de Leach spoke for scores of 18th century and 19th and 20th century scholars when in 1921 he wrote that the biblical text had experienced a degree of corruption beyond our wildest imagination. Until the 1940s such views represented the received wisdom. In 1939 British Museum creator and ancient manuscript authority Sir Frederick Kenyon wrote about the Masoretids who for many centuries had taken upon themselves to copy out the scriptures. The very oldest of their manuscripts dated from around AD 900. It was, he said, most regrettable that generations of Jewish rabbis, rabbis for more than a thousand years have viewed copies of the Holy Scriptures with such superstitious veneration that as soon as they became old and worn, the copies were reverently buried. Hence the absence of any Old Testament manuscripts to predate the Masoretic text of the AD 900s. By contrast, much earlier manuscripts of the New Testament survived and could be depended on. The great and all important question was this, does the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, which we call Masoretic, and when we have shown to descend from the text drawn up about AD 100, faithfully represent the Hebrew text as originally written by the authors of the Old Testament books? Kenyon was charitable, at least he put, it is a question. More scholars presented an answer to the question similar to that of Frederick de Leach. In the 1,300 years between the completion of Malachi and the oldest surviving Masoretic text, the Old Testament had been garbled beyond recognition. Some said. Question. What could devout Jewish and Christian scholars do? Answer. Come up with some inconclusive argument before withdrawing in embarrassment. Among themselves, they admitted... True enough, it was not reasonable to assume that having used up the ink of thousands of copyists over ten centuries, the Old Testament scriptures had remained unchanged. What was known of these copyists, their habits, their reputation for accuracy? So basically, the modern scholars were saying that it's been corrupted, the text, even evangelicals were coming to that conclusion. But things were about to change in the scholarly world. The Masoretics, Masoretis have a fascinating story. When Roman general Titus left Jerusalem in smouldering ruins in 1870, he might have assumed that the mass slaughter that accompanied Jerusalem's fall and the mass slaughter that had proceeded in the Galilean campaign had crushed Judaism forever. When Roman general Silva, after the AD 70-73 siege, entered the Zealot's mountain stronghold of Masada to find that Elysia and his supporters had committed mass suicide, he might have assumed they had witnessed the last stand of Judaism. When Roman Emperor Adrian levelled Old Testament Jerusalem in AD 135 and built a Roman city, Alia uh, Capitolania, over its base, he knew that scattered groups of hard-pressed Jews were to be found in Palestine and elsewhere, but was unlikely to have perceived them as any way significant. The Jewish religion had died with the destruction of the temple in AD 70, or had it? Judaism lived on without it, its temple and its system of sacrifice. Judaism became a religion of sacred writings and of scholars whose work was to preserve copy and interpret them. In AD 110, uh, Johann ben Zakia chaired the Council of Germania. Rabbi Akiba ben Joseph, AD 55 to 137, became its most important prominent member. He had grown up as an illiterate orphan shepherd boy and his giant intellect had been stretched by Ben Zakaya at the Rabbanic school in Germania. Akiba ought to 
sought to rally his scattered people around the sacred scripture. They were all that were left for the chosen people. Aqaba, based in uh, Tiberias, a city in Galilee, worked to standardize the Hebrew text. All subsequent copies and translations were based on Aqaba's standardized text. A group of scholars clustered around Aqaba at Tiberias. A similar group of rabbis were working on similar projects in Babylon. They worked both to translate and interpret the scriptures. The chief concern was the Torah, a law, the five books of Moses. They sought to take the broad principles of the law, to apply them in infinity of ingenious ways to all the complex situations of life. As a result, the Tiberius scholars produced the Mishnah, the rabbis in Babylon produced the Gemara, the two parts joined together in circa AD 500 to become the Talmud. Well before this time, the groups of Jewish scholars in Tiberius and Babylon had developed a high standard of tradition, of Mozara, of professionalism, in order to preserve the purity of the biblical manuscripts they were copying. They devised a complicated system of safeguards against mistakes. The wall was staying close to Aqaba's standardized text. They did from time to time consider variant readings found in manuscripts at their disposal. It was the widespread reference for the Masoretic text of the Old Testament that led biblical scholars who lived centuries after the Masoretes had completed their work to be completely satisfied with its authenticity. The Masoretes had been, after all, fanatics in their passion for accuracy and obsessiveness in their devotion to the tradition. The tradition to which they were devoted was the passing down and recovering of sacred manuscripts. So, so basically what we're seeing here is a lot of scholarship on the Old Testament. In the 19th century and 20th century it was doubting whether the Old Testament had been preserved because we only had like 900 AD manuscripts from 900 AD of the Old Testament. And so what the writer here is saying is, well, let's look at the Masoretes. The Masoretes were known to be accurate in the copying. So, how could we prove that the Masoretes, if we only had manuscripts from 900 AD, how can we prove against the 20th, 19th and 20th century scholars that the Masoretes were actually accurate in the copying of the Old Testament? So now we come to the Dead Sea Scrolls. When Muhammad Ed Dibid, a young Bedouin, shepherd lobbed a stone into a hole in the wall of the mountain fronting the Dead Sea, he had no idea that the echo would be heard around the world. After all, he had only been out looking for a missing goat. What he heard was the shattering of pottery. Wearily, the lad pulled himself up in the limestone cliff, still calling the animal as he went. Nearer to the opening then, he threw a second stone, again the same sound, the breaking of pottery. His curiosity heightened and the youth pulled himself up to the hall and then peered into the gloom of a small cave. He had only an instant to look and his fingers lost their grips and he fell. But in that brief glimpse in the interior of the cave he had seen enough to fire his courage. He climbed up a second time and he found a considerable number of cylinder, cyn, cylindrical jars which distinctly shaped caps. Did they contain gold jewels? Round about were the fragments of the jars his pebbles had broken. His nose had scented something far more valuable than any goat. Belonging to the Tamari tribe, he wandered across the wilderness of Judea between Bethlehem and the Dead Sea. He ran with speed and agility of one of the local ibexes to the shade of the hung animal skins, stakes and stench he called home. And he reported his find to an elder of his family. He too was interested and insisted on being taken to the spot. The next day he found them cramped in the cave. They counted seven or eight jars. Some of them were empty. Others were filled with what looked like bundles of rags. They felt they might be onto something when they came across folds of smooth brown leather. With the finds they returned to the encampment and their irreverent hands unrolled a scroll almost 2,000 years old. It stretched from one end of the tent to the other and they were looking at what would become known as the larger of two Isaiah scrolls. It was felt that their find had been, after all, quite useless 
They could not read the writing, the leather was too fragile to be put to any practical use for a time. As the Bedouins moved from place to place with their goats, they carried the scrolls with them and used them for trade with their neighbours, some they kept resolving to take them to Bethlehem. Perhaps they would fetch a better price. Market day in Bethlehem found them in earnest barter with a Syrian Christian by trade, a cobbler. He saw little practical value in the scrolls, but thought they might serve as raw materials for his shoemaking business. Therefore they were left littering the floor of his cobbler's shop for some days. Then he had a bright idea. The characters on the ancient scrolls looked somehow intriguing. Up at Jerusalem there would be someone who could understand the writing and therefore the value of the scrolls. He took them to the Syrian convent of St. Mark in Old City. Only then did the cobbler realise that the scrolls had considerable monetary value. Expeditions were organised to the cave. Soon, every cave within the vicinity of the original find was being ransacked. Complete secrecy shrouded their operations. They were acting illegally. Under the laws of the British mandate, the authorities should have been informed immediately. Instead, the Syrian metropolitan began to halt the fragments and the scrolls around the various scholarly institutions of Jerusalem to ascertain their exact worth. It was when they were shown to Professor E. L. Sukenik of the Hebrew University that reverberations of the original find began to be felt around the world. Dr. John Trevor of the American School of Oriental Research was the one who announced that when they were looking at what, at what was the scroll of Isaiah inscribed in Hebrew on papyrus from the present Christian period, you are holding, he told the Metropolitan, the oldest manuscript of the Bible ever known. The story was out. The original find had made in March 1947, then almost 12 months later, archaeologists and specialists in ancient languages began to converge on the spot. The manuscripts discovered up to that time were moved to the Archaeological Museum, now known as the Rockefeller Museum, Jerusalem. There was tremendous excitement in the scholarly world, and the excitement soon communicated itself to the world of journalism, and a great convergence of bodies massed in Jerusalem. Within a little more than 12 months of the original find, the Dead Sea Scrolls were making headline around the world. Those questions which had been hammering on the door of Judo Christian scholarship for as long were for so long were about to be answered. Excuse me. The main find were finds were made in caves around Qumran. Soon the caves were numbered. Mohammed Ed Dibbert's cave being cave one, cave four was a particularly rich one containing thirty five thousand scroll fragments. Scholars rather than Bedouins took the lead in searching for more treasure. Eventually ten manuscript containing caves were found in the vicinity of Kruman, four in the Wadi Waraba near Bethlehem, a small number in a valley south of En Gedi, and a few more during excavation of Masada, where the zealots had held out against the general silver AD seventy seventy three. During the period when the Seleucian king Antioch III and Antioch IV were involved, this is the Essenes. During the period when the Seleucian kings of Antioch III and Antioch, Antioch, Antiochus IV were enforcing the Greek language and culture on the Palestine, a community of ultra pious Jews established themselves at Qumran on the north shores of the Dead Sea. They were part of the reaction to the Hellenization process. While Jerusalem and Judea, Jews revolted under Maccabean leadership, the Essenes were building a monastery now excavated. Behind their monastery was the limestone face of the wilderness of Judea, honeycombed with caves. Their lifestyle was ascetic and their leaders known as the teacher of righteousness. The earliest coins found on the Qumran site date from the reign of John Acranus, High. Hierocanus 134 to 104 BC. The latest coins date from period AD 132 to 135, the time of the Second Jewish Revolt. However, it would appear that the monastery was vacated in AD 70, that the period of occupation at the time of the Second Revolt was but a brief one. It is likely that the Essenes fled in AD 70 when they learned of the approach of the Roman armies at the time of the fall of Jerusalem. Some unquestionably fled to Masada, 
and perished with the jealots, zealots there in AD 73. Central to the Qumran monastery had been the scriptorium, unquestionably an important part of the work of the Essenes community was to copy out the Old Testament scriptures together with other literature. Among the manuscripts discovered in the cave was the Manual of Discipline or the Rule of the Community. This valuable document gives us an insight into the life and beliefs of the community. They lived, they believed in the age of unparalleled wickedness of the Day of Judgment prophesied by Jeremiah and Ezekiel were at hand. The aim of the Essenes was to study the scripture, interpret them among the lines set down by the teacher of righteousness. The messianic age was about to dawn until the dawn of that age they had to devote themselves to strict adherence to the law of God and to the study and reproduction of scripture writings. When they learned in AD 70 of the mass slaughter in Galilee under Vespian and later of the fall of Jerusalem at the hands of Titus, they might have thought that the new age had dawned. When they became aware that their own community was under attack, that might have given them reason for doubt. The reaction must have been pre-planned and the caves pre-selected. The syndical vessels prepared whether Roman slaughter represented an end or a beginning of one thing the Essenes were determined they would preserve for posterity the sacred scriptures which they had over time so painstakingly set down. The distribution of the syndical vessels contained the scrolls over such wide area in the most access inaccessible of caves was in itself a mammoth task. If it did indeed take place as the legion approached the monastery, it must have been undertaken, undertaken with speed and great efficiency. Whatever their expectations or their fate, it is unlikely in the extreme that the Qumran Essenes expected that the sacred scriptures would remain undiscovered for 1,877 years. Wow. The scrolls. Though some discoveries were still to be made, by the end of 1952 the scale of what had been found was apparent. Biblical scholars were beginning to refer to the two eras in biblical studies, BQ and AQ, before Qumran and after Qumran. In modern Jerusalem, not far from uh, Knesset, in a strangely shaped building, the visitor had to be informed that this modern building had been designed to resemble the shape of the curious caps from the syndicate syndrically shaped vessels in which the scrolls have been found. It is called the Shrine of the Book and it has been built as a permanent home of the scrolls where the air is continually controlled and conditioned to facilitate their indefinite preservation. There the scrolls are, are on show including one perfectly preserved scroll, the famous Isaiah scroll. Others are a little more fragmentary but the fragments have in many cases been pieced together the old manuscripts date, manuscripts date from the 3rd century BC. There is a wealth of non-biblical material, but the amount of biblical and biblically related material is overwhelming. Every Old Testament book is represented with a single exception of the Old Testament. Until 1947, the most ancient Old Testament manuscripts was the Masoretic text, AD 900. Suddenly everything changed. The central point of interest for which like W. E. Albright and Siegfried H. Horn who conversed on Jerusalem in the early 1950s was to ascertain to the extent to which the 2000 year old Dead Sea Scrolls would uphold the accuracy of the Masoretti text and therefore the accuracy of the Old Testament accepted by Christians and Jews for so long. Albright had been the, mo the first to sense the importance of the scrolls and in the spring of 1948, he had told his students that the finds by the Dead Sea represented the greatest manuscript discovery of modern times. In the months and years thereafter, he and many others spent thousands of hours poring over detailed photographs of the scrolls. The scrolls were categorized, identified, pieced together. Some scholars were particularly interested in what the non-biblical scrolls could teach them about the Essenes and the century in which they had lived. Others, like Albright, were concerned with the all-important comparison between the Hebrew context of the scrolls and the Hebrew Old Testament based on the Masoretic text of AD 900. The two centuries dismissed 
by many experts as corrupted uh, corrupted copy of scriptures that were extant at the time of Christ. More was at stake than the reputation of the Masoretes as copyist. The real issue was the dependability of an important part source upon which Christian doctrine was based, the scriptures revered by the Jews and Christians. By 1952, in the careful comparison of the contents of the cave, one, dating from the time of Christ, with Masoretic text dating from the 10th century was complete. The texts were, to all practical purposes, identical. Differences were almost exclusively composed of spelling mistakes or of grammatical nature. At no point did the effect the sense of the biblical text then in use. It appeared that the Hebrew Bible, extant in the, day, in the days of Jesus, was the same as the Masoretic text from which the Old Testament of the 20th century had been translated. <coughs> the Isaiah scroll from Cave 1, much abused by the Bedouins and the Bethlehem Cobbler, contained a text from virtually identical with the printed Hebrew Bible then in use. As the years passed, and the contents of the caves were examined and compared, much was learned. There had been a few minor omissions and additions, but the Masoretic text reflected the scrolls fairly and faithfully. In places that content of the scrolls was closer to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the New Testament, than the Masoretic text. This illustrated that the Septuagint translators had followed a Hebrew revision ver revived version different from the version favoured by the Masoretis, but these minor considerations aside, the message of the Dead Sea Scrolls was this, the text of the Old Testament had been preserved unchanged down the centuries. But what of the experts since the 18th century are taught that down the centuries the biblical text experienced a degree of corruption beyond our wildest imagination? And what of the thousands who have believed them? Most were dead and others embarrassed. Many admitted that after all the Masoretic Bible was essentially the same as the Bible of Jesus and the Apostles. A few, however, prepared to fight another day. As the closeness of the Dead Sea Scroll manuscripts with the Hebrew Bible was being demonstrated, the critics began to attack the genuineness of the scrolls themselves. As each wave of criticism and counter-assertion emerged from Jerusalem and from the university campus of Western countries, the controversy was reported by the world's press rarely had the pronouncements of fus fusty academics made such headlines. In Europe and the United States, the dating of the scrolls from the 3rd century BC, very largely AD 70, was hotly contested. But as more scientific exploration took place and more scientific tests were applied, the age and genuineness of the scrolls were upheld. And as the Kurman Monastery was excavated, the evidence of pottery, coinage and other artefacts attested to the fact that the Essenes had occupied the site throughout the last three centuries before Christ until AD 70. There was then evidence of a brief Roman occupation of the site. Finally, scholars found artefacts which pointed to a further period of Jewish occupation at the time of the Second Jewish Revolt of AD 135. Thus, the archaeological evidence authenticated the dating of the manuscripts. There was addition scientific evidence. The linen wrappers containing the scrolls were subjected to carbon-14 dating tests. The great majority of the scrolls were dated to the three centuries before Christ, a few to the century after Christ, and very few to the second century AD. Again, the critics were silent. It was agreed that the age and genuineness of the scrolls were beyond dispute. So we'll do some more of the Battle of the Bible uh, in a, a few weeks' time. But um, what we see there is uh, you've got to be very careful uh, with the media. The media will pick up on scholars uh, hack scholars who are trying to get a name for themselves who will make statements like the Bible's changed like Bart Ehrman and people like that but then we find new documentary evidence and these are silenced and then they go quiet and then a new generation of scholars come and they say the Bible's changed and then we find more documents and they're silenced so in other words don't listen to these hack scholars who try to make a name of themselves in the news 
and, and they get all this fame for saying certain statements that the Bible's changed or we don't have the original Bible. But then we, redis we discover manuscripts like we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls and lo and behold the Old Testament has been proved to be preserved. The Masoretes, the Jewish scholars, were shown to be accurate in their copying. So you've got to be careful um, to listen to listen to scholars that don't have a name for themselves. Don't try to be famous. They are just quietly getting on, doing the work. Go and read their articles. Go and read their research. Okay, and uh, you know, just remember that when critics attack the Bible, they, they end up becoming embarrassed. Uh, we have now the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that has shown. Uh, not only the Old Testament, but also shown uh, the accuracy of the New Testament because we have manuscripts of the Dead Sea Scrolls that come in the time of Jesus. And, and these are texts that show the history of the times and they confirm the historicity of the New Testament as well as the manuscript attestation of the Old Testament. Okay, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love. And we thank you for your blessings and we give you the prayers and the glory that your word is truth and it's been preserved. And we give you the prayers and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and thank you for listening. Take care.